Hello, I'm so glad that you joined me today. I'm Robert Slairdon, and this is the God's General Show. In this program, we study the lives of revivals and those revivalists that God chose throughout time to see why they made it, why some failed. But today we're going to look at something a little bit different than a person from history. We're going to go to the biblical record. The Bible has certain storylines in it and certain personalities that it follows. And sometimes you find in the biblical record a short little comment like, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them, and there was great joy in the city. Well, that tells us something wonderful happened, but it does not give us the full biblical record of what he preached, what happened in great detail. We assume that all of these things that caused great joy were healings and salvations and deliverances. But we have something very interesting in the book of Acts called the Ephesus Revival. It is the one place in the scriptures that we have a complete story or the complete record of a revival from its beginning all the way to its end. And in this biblical record, we have different personalities that God used to lead the revival and to plow for the revival to happen. And so we're going to take this program and begin our biblical journey into the biblical record of what happened at Ephesus and how there came a great transformation of that city and the establishment of the great apostolic church at Ephesus. Now, there are two ways that we see in Scripture that revival comes one by sovereignty, and one by people plowing and doing daily and weekly and monthly work that over a period of time of sowing and watering that seed that a great revival happens. And so the Ephesus revival is one of those that they worked over two and a half years to get the breakthrough. Now, most of you watching thought two and a half years because you know how we read the Bible. We read chapter uh, 18 of Acts, and then we go to chapter 19 thinking it was 18 was on Monday, 19 was on Tuesday, and the 20th chapter was on Wednesday. But that's not true. Many times we overlook the timetable that Dr. Luke, who wrote Acts, put into the storyline, and we assume that it happened in three days. But the storyline of the timetable is very important so that we don't get discouraged. Some of you have been working so hard in prayer and so winning through your church and in your own personal outreaches in your city. And discouragement comes because it hasn't happened in three months or six months or a year. So this broadcast today as we study the Ephesus record of what happened to make this great revival happen is going to encourage you to be able to keep going and knowing that all spiritual labor has a fruit that remains. We're going to go live to a service where I was teaching this and I hope that you will take time out of your schedule and stop what you're doing and focus for the next 30 minutes and let me show you how to keep the plow revival going in your heart and in your city. In Acts 18 and verse 24 is where we'll start. The revival in Ephesus began with a little group of believers that had invited or recognized a young apostle named Apollos that came to town. It said in verse 24 of Acts 18, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, that's in Egypt. It's called Alexandria because Alexander the Great conquered it and named it after himself. He was an elegant man and he was mighty in scriptures and he came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things concerning the baptism of John. And when he began to speak boldly in the temple, there was a Holy Ghost couple named Aquila and Priscilla. When they heard Apollo speak, they went, wow. And they asked him to come to their home where they could expand more further to him the way of the Lord. Now let's stop right there just for a moment. We have a very unique personality that the biblical record does not give much uh, description about this wonderful apostle named Apollos. Apollos in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is given honor by Paul in his writings. In 1 Corinthians 3, I believe in verse 6, it says, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Apollos is a young man that Paul gave recognition to in his ministry. He valued Apollos. He honored him in his writings. He was never uh, negative or sarcastic toward him. He gave Apollos a great, great place of honor in his writings. Apollos 
was the first man that came to Ephesus that we have a record of here that began to plow the ground for the spiritual awakening that was to come in a few years in Ephesus. When we think about a revival, there are three stages to the labor of spiritual reviving. Somebody has to sow a seed. You cannot get a harvest unless the seed of the gospel has been sown into the heart and to the minds of the people of that territory. You cannot have a great move of God unless the seed of the gospel has been planted. Sometimes in my travels around the world, people are met at certain people groups or certain nations or certain parts of their nation that said, well, they're just hard-hearted people. They don't want anything to do with God. Well, that, that could be true, or it could be no one had enough guts to go among them and plant the seed of the gospel and water it so there can be a harvest among those people. In our world today, as we look at world missions, we used to see continents. William Carey went to a continent. Livingston went to the continent of Africa. So we had men in the early days of world missions. Do you realize at one time in the Christian faith, they didn't believe in world missions? They believed that if God wanted you to get saved, you get saved. And if you didn't get saved, he didn't want you, so you just go on to hell and burn. And there was no world missions heart. There was no desire to go and to tell the good news to what they would call the heathen or the unbelieving people. And they thought that the heathen deserved what they got. But slowly, men and a few women begin to speak about what we call the Great Commission. And then they begin to send people, one person or a family or a couple of families, to a whole continent. David Livingston, for example, went to Africa. One man went to Africa to help map it out and to bring the gospel to the interior part of Africa. They didn't send a team, they sent a man. Then we later in time, we begin to send groups and we begin to see nations instead of continents. And now if you follow the progression to where we are today, we're seeing cultural people groups instead of just territories of a nation. Does that make sense to everybody? Example, we've got gypsies in England. That's a people group. Or we got in America, we got the bikers. Or we've got the certain type of people that dress a certain way or they do a certain thing and they're known for that unique thing about them. And so we are gonna have to begin to realize that our missions today is not just to nations or parts of nations, but it is to people groups of the world. Specific people. Right here in Bradenton, Sarasota, you can find different little groups of peoples that nobody has ministering to. When you drive down 14th Street and you see all the different types of people that are in trouble and you see them there and you think, who's ministering to them? There are those who are caught in trafficking, those who are in prostitution, those who are different types of things. Well, that's not my ministry. It could be if you are willing to go be among them and be the person that plants the gospel seed. Sometimes some people aren't willing to be persecuted for being a planter of the gospel. When you go to people groups, the stigma is more powerfully against you at times than you are when you go to nations or to larger territories of a nation. When you go to a people group, then all the emotional and view of the stigma of what people don't like about them or the accusations of the unknown part of their lifestyle uh, comes against you because now you're seen among them. And the same way there was a fight in the early days of world missions to I, why would you go to Africa? They're a heathen. They're going to die and go to hell anyway. If God wanted to save them, he would save them. No. Somebody said they can't believe unless somebody tells them. And they begin to break the barrier, and they begin to break the cultural church attitude against them. Today, we have no problem thinking, I'm going to Congo, I'm going to China, I'm going to Brazil. We love that, we cheer that, we support that. But what if you were called to the gay people? What if you were called to the, the drug addicts? What if you were called to different types of people groups in our community? There is stigma today with the people groups that we have to break the same way the early guys in world missions broke it in the 16 and 1700s. 
And I'm not sure that many people are willing to cross that line today to go through the persecution from the church to pioneer a new realm of missionary work among our own people. Good morning, everybody. Are you awake? Have you gone to sleep? I'm preaching better than you're responding. Good morning, everybody. See, some of you think, well, I'm called to China. You might end up in China with a certain kind of people. You may be right here in America with a certain group of people in our culture. Some people may cheer you. Others may, "Mm, I don't know about that. You know why you don't know about it? Because God didn't tell you to do it. So hush up and be quiet. And let the people that God told to do it, go do it. You bless them, give them a nice fat check and be quiet. Good preaching, Brother Roberts. Amen. Now, let's go back and look at, and see, some of you still don't quite know what to do with me. I guess I'll live my whole life with that attitude. All right, verse 24. Let's look at what kind of a planter he was. You can't be a gospel planter and a water of that seed if you don't have some of the characteristics of Apollos. Paulus was a man that had an elegance about him. You have to know how to arise and to uh, be able to acclimate to whatever type of people you're around. Uh, Sometimes people feel called to to a certain people group, but they won't learn the language of that people group. They won't learn the dress code of that people group. They won't learn the timetables of those people groups. Some people get together at 10 o'clock every day. Others once a week at midnight. And if that's how they gather, that's how where you've got to be. I have a friend of mine in the Philippines that's called to, you know, when you have these call centers that when you make the phone calls to fix your phone or whatever it is, you go overseas. And sometimes you get a call center in the Philippines. His whole ministry is to the call center workers and he has church at three o'clock at night. That's when they get off work. If you're going to be a seed sower, or a waterer, or a harvester in a certain kind of people group, you have to accommodate how they live and function their life. If you can't do that, then you're not going to be very fruitful of it. Well, they don't come to my church because, you know, uh, we, we meet at 10 o'clock on Sundays. Well, they already go to church at 3 at night on Tuesdays. See, so you have to accommodate that. And he gets up at 1 o'clock uh, every day at night a- a- and goes out to start his services for all the call center people that he can reach. He's found his people group and he's fervent about it. It says that he was mighty in scripture. You cannot be a seed sower just by being a storyteller. You have to have the eternal word in you so God can pull it out of you. A great preacher is not one that is academically smart. It is one that has put the word inside of their spirit and gives much for the Holy Spirit to work with, to pull out of his mouth or her mouth when they preach. That's what inspirational preaching is. You know, back uh, when I was a little boy, uh, we thought good preachers are those who could spit and talk real fast. But then as I got a little older, I realized they didn't say much. And much, most of it was cliches, little sayings that moved people's emotions or there was a hot button uh, phraseology of the time and there wasn't much substance in those sermons. And that wasn't called preaching, that was just called hot air. If you're gonna be a good preacher, the word of God has to be in you so that the Holy Spirit can pull it out of you as he orchestrates it by his will. You have to give the word of the Holy Spirit, the word in you, something to work with to be a preacher. When somebody is mighty in scripture, they also can hear God's voice when somebody else is talking. Uh, Sometimes I wonder uh, how some people uh, function. Uh, They seem to think they know everything and they seem to think they are good in scripture, but when God is speaking through another person, they don't seem to recognize it. One of the great ways to recognize God's voice into the person's mouth is when you're familiar with his word, you can identify what's happening and coming out of somebody else's heart and mouth. Amen? Amen. And so this young apostle, Apollos, was very mighty in the scriptures as he knew them. 
So if you're going to be a seed sower, you've got to have the word in you. That's why coming to a Bible school like this and getting the word and the years of experience of Pastor Phil and Brother Gerald and the other teachers helps you be prepared to be a great seed sower wherever God plants you. Amen. 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 Say, well, I'm just going to show up and you'll go into prison when you show up. You won't be free there. The word in you keeps you free and the word in you helps create a harvest. And it says that when he was able, uh, when the Priscilla and Aquila came to him, they said, we, we want to help you with something. And Apollos received their counsel. The first plow of the Ephesus revival was done by Apollos. Sometimes revivals, we have to be willing, I'll say it like this. We have to be willing to sow a seed and never see a harvest. Sometimes we have to be able to water the seed and never see the harvest. Sometimes we plant, we water, and we have the harvest. Or sometimes you're the third element of this happening. And you show up at a harvest time and the souls come in and the breakthrough happens and you think you're all wonderful because the harvest happened at your moment. I remember I sent over 500 graduates of our school to the nations of the world and paid for it. And we sent uh, two young men to Mongolia. Uh, we had received an invitation for some of our graduates to come to Mongolia after the communistic rule had fallen flat on the floor. And so we were excited about the invitation, but I thought we, we can't send uh, a Florida person to Mongolia. You want to know why? They can't survive the winter. Mongolia is above China, up there in that part by Siberia, uh, on the Asianic side uh, of the globe. And uh, so I chose somebody from Minnesota and somebody from Wyoming because they understood winter. If I'd have sent somebody else, I'm not quite sure they could have handled it naturally being the first ones to go in. And so we, we called them together and told them, what we thought we'd like to do, if they would pray about it and feel if it was in their heart to do it, it would be an unknown adventure that we could not guarantee anything but an adventure for them. And they prayed and they said, yes, they'll go. And so they had to become friends themselves because they had only been acquainted since they were in two opposite classes. And then we sent them to China and they got on a train and they went north into Mongolia. And then when they got off the train in Mongolia, the folks who were to pick them up wasn't there for two weeks. They got stuck out in Mongolia in a storm of winter and couldn't make it to Ulubatar to pick up the two young men. Right, right there is when most folks go, where's the jets at? We're going home. But they found them a little place to stay and they begin work praying and doing what they needed to do and finally connection was made. And then a great happening began to take place. A, a move began to happen there. And so they came back and began to give a report at our great camp meeting and they were saying how the revival in the school was growing and things were happening. And they were so excited. And I was standing back here on the back of the stage listening to them. And the Lord said, tell them and your other students that there are the harvesting time for most of the nations where they're at. They weren't there in the planting season. They weren't there in the watering season. They arrived at harvest time. Now, we all like harvest time because it's easy. He just announced it in the most simple way and people run to Jesus. But we must recognize for that to happen, somebody somewhere had planted the seed. Somebody somewhere in the past of that territory had watered the seed that had been planted and a harvest came when you showed up. So don't ever think you're all of that. Just praise God you showed up when you were supposed to and you're enjoying the harvest time of that moment. But it brings me to this statement again. Could you labor in a territory and never see a harvest and know that you have to plant a seed for another generation or another time period to have the harvest? Could you be motivated to keep going and never see the great breakthrough that you saw in the spirit of why you were led there? Some of us will be led to a territory to be the seed sower or the waterer. And we may get a few saved and have some degree of miraculous, but we sit within our heart 
Why hasn't the vision that we've seen come to pass yet? Maybe you're not the actual person who will be the harvester of the labor that you are doing right now. And you have to be willing as a revival people to say, if I never see the harvest, I'll be glad to know I helped plant the seed that created the harvest one day. Or I've been the waterer of the seeds at some other time period. Or the next guy after me comes in and has it. Sometimes jealousy sparks in people like that. Sometimes people get angry because it didn't happen with them the way they thought. I remember the great story of the Scandinavian revival in the 80s and 90s. It was a little white house in Finland where a group of less than 20 people had gathered together on a consistent basis over a few years to pray for God to send a sweeping revival to Finland and to Scandinavia. And one prayer meeting night, the word of prophecy came to them. Go to America and get my word of faith and bring it back. Well, they had no idea what that meant at that time. They were up kind of in the woods part of Finland in a white house is where they prayed in someone's white house. So they all put their money together to send a young couple they thought would be good to America. So they gave them enough money to buy a ticket to get to New York City and enough money to go from New York to someplace else, but where, they didn't know. So this young couple flew from Helsinki to JFK in New York, got off the plane and went through customs and got their bag and was standing there and didn't know what to do. So they were just looking at the different cities of where planes were going. And they thought, let's go to Tulsa. Sounds kind of nice. It's the middle of the country. They didn't know anything about Tulsa, Oklahoma at that time. And so they bought a ticket from New York to Tulsa. They got to Tulsa in July is when they were doing this. And in Tulsa in July is when you feel like you've gone to hell. It's so hot during that season and that month in Oklahoma. They got off the plane in Tulsa and they were waiting for their bags and they thought, well, we might as well just ask somebody about a word of faith thing. They didn't know what it meant. They just had to knew it was a scriptural phrase in the Bible. And as they were waiting for their bags, they asked the person next to them, uh, we, we've come here for uh, something called word of faith. You know what that is? They go, oh yeah, that's Brother Hagin. He's having his camp meeting this week. Who, who's Brother Hagin and what's a camp meeting and where's it at? And so they found their way to the Tulsa Convention Center of the week of Brother Hagin's camp meeting. They sat there and they, or they walked through the, the foyer of the convention and picked up Brother Hagin's magazine that was called Word of Faith. Whoa, we found it. They went to the meeting all week long and asked to see some of the officials of Rama and the school there. And they asked for somebody to be sent to them to bring this message because they told them what God had showed them. They sent two of Brother Hagin's first year graduates to Helsinki or to Finland. When they got there to have a little house meeting, they didn't like the two preachers that showed up because they had shiny shoes. And that's what caused the majority of these 20 people to go no and reject the revival. They helped pray it in. Sad, huh? Please don't be that stupid. The problem was they had already pre-programmed in their mind how, who, and what it would be. Sometimes you have to be willing to say, I thought it was like this, but it's like this. And be willing to let your imagination or your preference die in the light of what God is doing and join in it. Or you'll miss what labor you've done and the fruit of the labor you can enjoy. I'm so glad you spent the time with me today to listen to uh, the first part of this message on the great Ephesus revival. It is one of the few places, like I said earlier in scripture, where there's a complete record of the revival from its beginning all the way to its end. Now, we have this message in its entirety for you on DVD or CD, and if you would like to have a copy of that, you know, on television, you've got a break and you've got to come back next week for part two or part three, and so, but if you buy the DVD or the CD, uh, you have it without any breaks, so you can call the number on your screen or write the address on your screen, or you can go to my website 
and download it and get it directly. And so you'll have it almost immediately if you go to the website and, and get it that way. Also this week, I want to offer you one of my books that I've written called God's Generals. Most of you know of the series that I've written, but this is volume three called The Great Revivalist. In this book, we talk about John and Charles Wesley. We talk about George Whitfield, Charles Finney, Peter Cartwright, the great Cambridge camp meeting in Tennessee. We talk about Billy Graham. We talk about D.L. Moody that preached to 100 million people in his lifetime. And so in these books that I write, uh, we tell you the good, the bad and the ugly, so that we will be able to make the same successes and jump over their failures and not go through the trials and tribulations that some of them have gone through. You'll enjoy reading this book and seeing the lives of these great revivalists and learning what they did to cause their generation and their nations to change. I want to encourage you that are, are in all parts of the world, especially you that are in Europe, Europe right now is going through a great challenge uh, with the influx of false religions and aggressive secularism that is trying to take over the great continent of Europe. We don't want you to be discouraged. Keep your prayers up. Keep your seed sowing. Keep watering the gospel seeds that are already in the ground of Europe and, and, and move forward. Uh, in your own faith and in your church home. Do not be one of those that give up and don't go to church or just say, there's no hope. There is hope. Prayers work. Sowing the ground with the gospel works. There is going to be a great revival in Europe and you're going to be a part of it. All over the world, we need to make sure that we remember, when you sow a seed, it never returns void. Don't faint when doing the right thing because you'll reap in the right season. I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to make sure that what we're doing here every week is ministering to your life and lifting you up. If you could call us or email me and tell me what this broadcast means to you. If you would like to be a partner with our ministry, we would appreciate that so much because these broadcasts are made um, possible by our partners and our friends that take a portion of what they make every week and send it to us so we can do what we're doing around the world. We'd appreciate you becoming one of those ambassador partners with our ministry. I pray for you every day. My team prays for you. We're going to be advancing the cause of revival in these last days. And one way that we're doing it is through television. We're so glad that you joined us. And remember, next week at the same time and the same place, we'll be doing part two of this great Ephesus revival. Don't miss it. I'll see you then. To purchase a copy of this message or to partner with Roberts Lid and Ministries, visit us at www.robertsleardon.com. Contact us today to purchase books and products by Roberts Learden by calling or writing to our USA or UK offices. You can follow Roberts Learden on Facebook and Twitter by joining online today. Roberts Learden Ministries would like to thank our partners and friends for their kind generosity through which this broadcast has been made possible. Music